Now, from a safe distance, he saw the entirety of his existence in a new light. Whatever he had believed, he believed because not believing meant ceasing to exist. What was best to believe? It depends. On what? On the consequences of not believing. But what did the belief guarantee? Nothing, to be precise. Why nothing? Because one's belief ensured nothing about the belief of others. Their beliefs could suddenly change, or their shared belief might eventually reveal itself as mass delusion, and no one was safe in a state of collective insanity. This is from your new book, Michael. Yes. And it's very different from the rest of the book. It is all of a sudden we're just in this chapter in this guy's life. And what jumped out at me was, A, it's very poetic. It's beautiful writing. But the safe distance he was from, he mm -hmm. was in a safe distance. And now he could see that whatever he did didn't matter. Yeah. You can believe it. You can profess a belief. You can actually believe it or not believe it, but it doesn't guarantee your safety ever. Right, exactly. That's that's what I was getting at there, and also that the, the belief in a in a place like this, where where belief is enforced, you know, it's enforced through a totalitarian means. Uh, you must believe, or at least pretend to believe, or else you're you're in trouble. And we're there now in America. Yeah, we're really starting. To yes, be we there. are. And you're starting to see that it doesn't matter what you believed. Doesn't matter even if you were on the side, the quote right side for a while. If you don't travel with them and their belief, it can change, and it can it change. Changes. It changes and it changes and it se and seems to have changed into mass insanity. So why? Why? Why did you write this in story form? Because your book is um, your book is about digital gulags yes. that are being built. It is. A, it's a. It's a argumentative. It's a expository prose. It is a speculative. I, I admit there's speculation in there. It is not fiction. The, I thought that I should have like a, a, a an interlude of fiction that's just not you know that's not really that far from reality. Yeah. And that it would give us the experience of being inside the, the digital. Uh, gulag or the Gulag Archipelago. So explain what that is. Well, the Gulag Archipelago is is the electronic digital hypermedia version of the Gulag. I think it is going to be a place of mass and total surveillance, a place of uh, where everyone's movements are tracked, traced, recorded, uh, where everything is known. It's an omniscience of sorts. And there are going to be all kinds of policing uh, ramifications involved. So, uh, first of all, let's um, archipelago is a is a collection of islands. That's right. And so, when you say it's the Google archipelago, right. you're saying that that's just that's just one. That's just one island. Right. Yeah, they're it's, they're the emblematic island of the whole archipelago, which consists of other uh, islands like Facebook, like Instagram, like. Would you, know, you include the NSA? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, they funded, along right. with the CIA, they funded uh, Google at the outset. Mm. So this was an intelligence project to begin with. They wanted to use the internet to as a data mining uh, opportunity because of uh, an unprecedented opportunity to, date, to mine data. And uh, so they funded some very clever people at Stanford and around the Silicon Valley. Hmm. And those, peop those people became Google, one, one part of them. Uh, and, you know, they, I'm not, you know, particularly that alarmed about that aspect because DARPA has funded a lot of research. Mm -hmm. The Internet itself mm -hmm. has, of course, military uh, Implications, in yeah. origins. And, yeah, origins. Uh, so uh, the question becomes what, what becomes of it, I think, you know. So... It, it, so, it has that uh, potential, of course, to be authoritarian when it comes from that kind of a basis. So I think th there's a couple of things. The left keeps saying, uh, we're headed towards fascism. We're headed towards fascism. Well, welcome to the party. We've been saying that for a while. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, they say things like, so let's give the government all our guns. 
Yes. So there's this 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 disconnect mm-hmm. from what they're saying um, to what they're saying they want to do. Let's mm-hmm. the government is a problem. Let's grow the size of the government. Yeah. But what's frightening to me is that that's where the right has always um, said, okay, we have to have small government. Mm-hmm. I mean, the real classical yeah, yeah, yeah. liberal right. Sure. Um, uh, we have to control the size of the government, but corporations are okay. Yeah. Corporations are actually more frightening now mm-hmm. than any government because the government is restrained by the Constitution. But these, right. as private organizations, they have none of those restrictions. None of those restrictions. And they're, and they're arbitrating our speech rights at this point, our expression. Right. And what you talked about, in fact, let me see if I can find the exact line uh, that you you said— um, you, I can't find it now, but you, you talked about how you are, you're just erased. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're erased. Erased. So in the former Soviet Union, you disappear. And yeah, you could be disappeared, as right. they would call it. Yeah, you would be disappeared. You'd, you'd be disappeared in the middle of the night. You'd, you know, the guard, they would come to your house, you know, and, 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 and and uh, basically pull you out of your house, and you'd be right. gone, and your and family nobody would, would nobody would ever know what and, happened and, and to you. you. They like would you never guess, lived. but you know, your children would be left behind, your wife right. would be left behind, and you'd be gone. Right. And this happened routinely. Right. I mean, Solzhenitsyn talked about it quite, quite <laughs> prolifically. Yes. Right. And, and and but the point is, is that you. It's like you didn't even exist. That's right. Because you really didn't want to ask questions or you might face the same fate. And so you were just gone. Yes. And the thing is, this is, you know, I mean, in the Google archipelago, it's not so much corporal. However, yes, it is just as much easier to delete a, a piece of data than it is a, a corporal human being. Yes. So, and it's a socially, it's a social death in effect, because if you're deleted, so, you know, digitally, in effect, you're gone. If you are, I mean, everybody knows this. If you are homeless, mm-hmm. you're invisible. Yes. Okay. You're an invisible per- You walk down the streets of any city, especially a city like New York. Mm-hmm. You're walking down the city. You don't even get eye contact. That's okay? correct. People don't even look at you. That's right. Even though you're there. And mm-hmm. there's a number of homeless people all around. Mm-hmm. You're invisible. And one of the biggest problems there is the lack of di- of, of actual documentation right. to prove you are somebody. Right. You know, and also that you have an address or something. Something. That they can send a check to or something. Right. But if that's all gone, you're basically a so, non-person. And so we're not talking about... We're not talking about scooping you up in the middle of the night and putting you into a gulag or Mm -mm. behind a wall. Right. We're talking about in the middle of the night, you're just deleted. Deleted. You don't have a bank. You don't have credit cards. Right. You don't have the rights of a license, maybe, perhaps. You you are nobody on social media. Say you're traveling. It's all gone. You're traveling to uh, London, New York, uh, Paris, whatever. You, you, you know, you're relying on digital technology to be able to go to a hotel or to do anything. And what if you're just the person in the process because you've been critical of something or you've said something wrong? And they have put you on a list of dangerous persons. Interestingly enough, that language, dangerous persons, is the exact same language that Facebook is using in their policy manuals. The same words as the Soviet Union used. Really? Yes. This is, and I've been saying this for years, what's coming, we had dinner just the other day with somebody. Yes, and it was enjoyable. We were talking about, we were talking to somebody at the table that um, has a very different viewpoint yeah. of, of China. Yeah. And you and I were both <laughs> saying, you don't get it. No. Man. You don't understand yeah. the digital world on what's coming. Yeah. And um, people really think that this is, oh, some sort of sci-fi mm-hmm. nightmare. And when you right. t- talk about technology, you know, oh, it's Skynet's going to get, yeah. well, kind of. Sort it's of, kind yeah. of Skynet, just not a movie kind. It's going to be very quiet. Yeah, I happens. mean, like when I was writing this book, I was like, oh. 
am I crazy or what? And then I would read deeper, and the further out I would go, I was like, no, it's worse than I thought. Yeah. Then I would I write agree. more, and I'd read, and I'd say, am I, am I going off the edge here? Then I'd go deeper, and it's worse than I thought. Yeah. And this just has continued. Every single person I know that has done their research, really intelligent people on both sides of the aisle, everyone who's done their research, they say the same thing. Really? It's worse than I thought it was. <laughs> exactly worse than I thought. Because you know? it's, the, we're, we're talking, well, first of all, as you said, it's not corporal. Mm -hmm. So you, we'd all know if somebody was out saying, we're going to have a bonfire of books, mm -hmm. we'd all have a problem. That's right. But maybe. Well, <laughs> some, yeah, maybe. Some, some leftists some, yeah, might some, enjoy some, it. Right. Um, most of us would have a problem. We, That's we, right. we are taught book burning is bad because mm -hmm. of the past. That's right. But just like all of the atrocities in the past, uh, it, History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. That's right. And this rhymes with book burning. All of a sudden, those books are no longer available. They're no longer on the shelf. They're, they're, they've just disappeared. And when you're all digital, things can disappear overnight. And they can change. Yes. They can change. I mean, when Google was, you know, I was one of the first adopters of Google Books because I thought, you know, I was doing deep research into 19th century studies, mm -hmm. and I was being, I was able to find periodicals that That's I, great. that I used to have to go dig in archives, oh, yeah. and, you know, all over uh, England for, and yeah. I was able to see this. It was like uh, it was like a cornucopia. I was like, yeah. oh, this is wonderful. Yeah, you know. But then I, you know, I started thinking. Then they then they want you to uh, to recognize that it's theirs, and effectively. The, the scary part is what happens to them because they are digital now. Everything is is really it's ephemeral. It's ephemeral. There's no uh, and there's and, and librarians are saying that they're taking out books out of the library that are not acceptable, and they're getting rid of them and replacing them with other books. And we don't even and then if those books are unavailable physically, we don't know whether they're going to be preserved digitally at all. Right. So we're, you know this is the erasure of history, which is a very big. It's always been a big tool of totalitarians. You must erase history, parts of history, history that contradicts what you're after, history that is against what you're going for. It's uh, really, in a way, it's Fahrenheit, and, uh, uh, f what is it, Fahrenheit four, 411? Four, four, yeah, uh, 451. Or 451, yeah. yeah. Fahrenheit 451 without the firemen. Yeah. You don't need the you firemen. Don't, you don't need the firemen. You don't need the firemen. And so that you don't need the book burning, and you you don't need soma, uh, because you have digital di addiction, as you put it. You know this is addiction, I'm afraid, and the digital addiction has been very seductive. So it's drawn people into a very seductive space, uh, but to what, at what cost? That's right. the question. There's other things to. Um to, I think, be concerned about that people aren't thinking through. Yeah. That um, your manipul the manipulation, you're familiar with Cass Sunstein, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Cass Sunstein, um, you know, is a behavioral scientist, and there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, but when you start looking at the behaviors and you look for a way to manipulate mm -hmm. people, Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what his book Nudge was about. Mm -hmm. and, and he's very much cut from, you know, the cloth of Edwin Bernays, who was, you know, he was a, he was the father of propaganda. Yeah. They later changed it to advertising, yeah. but only because we saw how propaganda was used. But he was the father of propaganda. Propaganda now is, is, is an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So it's not a pretty poster. It's not a film using rats to make you think people are rats. It's just an algorithm. Yeah. And it's it's nudge. It's what you make hard to find mm -hmm. and what you make easy to find. Where are we headed? I, I said in 1995 <clears throat> on the air, one of my producers who's still with me, he says he'll never forget because he remembers thinking that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And I said, there's coming a time very soon where you will not be able to believe your eyes or your ears, that you will be able to recreate anybody saying anything, mm -hmm. and you will swear it is, yeah. and you'll be able to do the same thing with with video. Yeah. And here we are, and I think 2020 election is where it's going to really start to hit the fan. Mm -hmm. um, 
you have that ability now in yeah. deep fakes. Yeah. And the the voice, which was the one that was lagging behind, um, that is getting to the point to where you can't tell the difference. Go to, yeah. f- I think it's fakejoerogan.com mm-hmm. and see back and forth. You can't tell the difference. Right. It's all digitally reproduced, right. remastered. And yeah. you can just make him say absolutely right. anything. Right. Um, what happens to a society when there is no one you can trust and the ones who say, no, you can trust us. Are the actual are the most right least trustworthy right. people. Are right. the ones that are manipulating things through, through algorithms. Yes, I mean, that's where we are. Google's one of them, of course, and this new knowledge group. Uh, there's others. And you know, you know, there's an interesting story, just to be symmetrical, okay? It's very curious to me how this Russian bot story kept floating around and going on and on for three years. Because there was a group that actually helped, uh, a digital corporation that helped Trump win, mm-hmm. called Cambridge Analytical. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. they did do digital manipulation. It wasn't mm-hmm. it wasn't nefarious. Well, there was nothing illegal. Mm-hmm. But what they did is they they did a, a psychographic profiles of every single American, mm-hmm. and then they fed them dark ads. That means ads that no one else can see on Facebook, and steered them into different into a certain position. So. How even the even the liberal media misses the real story, which is which actually favors them instead and goes with this lunacy script, you know why? I don't get it. So play this out, Michael. What happens to society like this? I mean, I think it's usually an eighty-year cycle, mm-hmm. usually yeah. for. Uh, uh, you know, you fall into totalitarianism yeah. and you climb back out of it yeah. in 80 years usually. Yeah. yeah, This one, there may not be any climbing out of. Yeah, there, there's something about digitization that produces collectivism. And uh, In I, what way? Well, I explore it in this book and it's, it's complicated in a sense, but it's easy to, it's easy to aggregate data. Mm-hmm. And when people are effectively data, it's very easy to aggregate people. And so right. they start to use... you're not they use, an individual. You're getting collectivized through algorithms, hashtags, different things like that. And that's what they're doing. They're creating these... I call it digital Maoism. Um, mm-hmm. There's a chapter in the book called Digital Maoism, and it might sound crazy, but once you read it, I think you'll think, oh, my, there is... Make the case. Yeah. Make the case. No? Now. Yeah. Well, it wasn't my term. I borrowed it, so and that gives me a little bit of uh, for, <laughs> that helps me a bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jerron Lanier is a brilliant guy that it, he he coined the term in an essay in 2006, and uh, he he was really talking about Wikipedia and how this hive mind of editors was. He experienced this in particular with his own website or his own site on Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. They were saying all kinds of false things, and he was mm-hmm. like, no, I can tell you the truth about me. Right. Well, won't you just listen? And they're right. like, no. Right. And they said, well, you're no authority here. We are. Right. So, so this hive mind decided on what he was, and it was all kind of false stuff. I have I have the same thing. I think it might still even be on there, that I was arrested <laughs> uh, for drunk driving. I've never been arrested <laughs> in my life, yeah. never driven drunk yeah. in my life. Yeah. Uh, and it's on there, and... I tried to have it removed, and I, oh, I couldn't no, get it removed. No, it's my life. <laughs> you can't. You are not uh, a, no. a ver- You are not a trustworthy uh, source. Source your for yourself. Story. Yeah. I yeah. Know. And that's what he found, and he found it deployed. Mm-hmm. He said, "This is craziness," you know. But it's gone further than that since we've got Twitter mobs, of course, with you know using hashtags mm-hmm. and all that. It's created all these kind of like red guard type attack. Uh, mm-hmm. dogs, if mm-hmm. you will, that are just insanely uh, virulent and fierce and destroy, destructive of people, you know. Um, and if people, you know, take these people seriously, there are people who have committed suicide over these people. Oh, yeah. This stuff. So this is a collectivization that's happening. And the interesting thing is this. The left believes that when they are in a collective, they are being radical. That's, that's their whole definition of, of politics. Their definition of politics is this. We, are, we have to collectivize in order to have power against the big guys with the money and everything else. Mm-hmm. If we don't join forces and have solidarity amongst ourselves, we can't combat the powers that be. 
So collectivism is their basic premise for all politics. Now, the thing is, they can be fooled into believing they're doing something political just because they're in a collective. And that's what's going on on the internet. They think they're being political, but they're actually being used by mm -hmm. but I think our corporate globalist agenda. Uh, and so they think, wow, we're really, you know, we're really woke. We're, we're attacking all these people, especially those that uh, are called dangerous by the Google archipelago. We're, we're driving down the evil people. We're tracking them down. Mm -hmm. We're destroying them, right? But they're, they're not getting the picture that they're actually supporting. <clears throat> well, I, I've, you know, you could say that about, let's just take Google and Facebook for mm -hmm. a second. They actually believe they're doing good. good. Oh, yes. Um, and and they actually believe it while they're helping places like China. Mm -hmm. And and I know that with Project Dragonfly, at right. least, there were those who stood up and said, uh, no, no, I can't work with you if you're going right. to do this. They're back in bed with China, now yeah, under right. a different name, but they're back in bed with China. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I really don't understand how the workers, the, mm -hmm. uh, the regular person, doesn't see this is a really bad idea. We're helping China mm -hmm. scoop up people that want to stand up against their government. Yeah. How, where is that disconnect, Michael? Well, I don't know. I think maybe it's birds of a feather stick together. I think that they share a, deep, a deeply a shared deep ideology of authoritarian leftism, uh, um, that th this is, this is they're, that it's okay. They're akin to these, this whole idea. Yes, I mean, y y uh, there's been a number of people that have said China's the model. Yes. Right? Yeah, it's the model of future. It's the model of the future because what? It, it has both the profit uh, mm -hmm. incentive for the mm -hmm. massive corporations, mm -hmm. plus it has the total control of the population, mm -hmm. you know, so that's the model for certain types. Now, I'm I'm not saying that's capitalism altogether at all. I'm a free market person. Mm -hmm. I, I think that I believe in the free market, but that's not a free market. It's that's a no, state. No, and neither are we. No, yeah, we're, we're, we're also so. You know, the Google Archipelago. I'm saying is ingratiating itself to the state and vice correct. versa, and this is giving them state power. They're government. going to, you know, it's funny. Any time, you look this up in history, any time companies rush for legislation and to have restrictions and regulation put on yes. them, it's because they know they're in trouble. Okay, Usually it's because of collapse. I need protection from the little guys. What it does is protect them. It's, it, makes the, it makes the cost of entry higher. Yes. This keeps the competition out. It's a, Correct. It's a monopolistic Correct. move. Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And so this time you have these corporations coming and everybody I, I don't know what I'm I don't know what I'm more worried about. And I think I I think I know. I think I would rather have the Chinese uh kind of of uh the government control mm -hmm. than this illusion of, of the government not being in control. And it's the it's those huge companies that are in bed with the government yeah. that don't have any rules that they can't make up overnight. They can change their rules. Constitution, you can't change. Yes. But if it's a private company, they can make up any rule they want. That's they right. could change them every day if they wanted. And the other scary thing, uh, the other reason for that, I think, <laughs> is that when you have a totalitarian state, it's it's pretty it's pretty, shall I say, it's pretty natural to oppose it. But when you're when you're talking about a corporate totalitarianism, I think, which is like a state uh, that's being effectively off, you know, passed off to the corporate uh, powers that be, and they're running the uh, they're running the state, they're effectively amplifying and uh, undertaking state functions. It's, it's much more difficult to point to them and say this is what they are uh, because they're, they're masking it through other things. Give me an example. Uh, let's, say, uh, let's take uh, Google and their, um, their, their, their ranking of websites you know, when, they, when you do a search. Uh, th th this, this has been proven now to be completely 
a sham. In fact, if it's not leftist intrinsically, they override it and make it leftist so that they disappear. Whole websites, mm-hmm. they blacklist whole mm-hmm. websites. They get rid of all kinds of mm-hmm. news. They and YouTube did this too. They uh, one of the one of these uh, Congress persons did a YouTube. Oh no, it was a Slate magazine writer. She did a YouTube search for abortion, and to her chagrin, like the top ten searches showed mm-hmm. negative stories about abortion. So mm-hmm. she complained to, to YouTube, and they changed it by the over the weekend, by Monday. So that the story, so that the list was now almost all pro-abortion at the top. So, how does that connect? That can that that's like, that's not exactly governmental, but in a way, it, it is governmental. I mean, it's their prerogative. They have a prerogative to do it, and it's harder to, like you said, every conservative will tell you, "I'm not for regulation. I'm not for breaking companies up. I'm no. not for." I'm not for uh, penalizing companies right. that have succeeded. Don't punish success. This is becoming so clearly every single person that I have ever spoken to in Silicon Valley that is somebody. You yeah. know what I mean? From right. from the Zuckerbergs down to the main programmers who are looking at the architecture of what's coming. Mm-hmm. They all say the same thing. Glenn, the nation state is it's a thing over. of the past. Yes. It's over. And they think they're it. Right. And they are. And I didn't understand that when they were talking about it, they were saying, you know, so we have to have new rules and a new kind of uh, understanding. The Constitution won't work. The nation state is over. It's going to be borderless. And I couldn't get past my small thinking of uh, the United States is not going to take a border Mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, the United States won't have to. It won't matter mm-hmm. anymore. That's right. Because the corporations will be able to control and move things across borders and and track you everywhere That's and right. do everything they want to do. And here's the twist. This is why they are actually leftists. Because their agenda f- matches the left's prerogatives almost point by point. Yeah. And it's incredible. See, this is a very big deception because... First of all, anybody that says that like the corporate America is is embracing leftist ideology is considered a loon, because you know the story goes. Oh, of course, corporations and and, and capitalism always favors right wing ideology. It supports their interests. Blah 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 blah. There's no way that they would ever be leftist, right? But it actually is not the case. It's not been the. It's not always been the hist- the case historically. There have been plenty of mm-hmm. leftist capitalists. And this time, and they're always monopolists, by the way, like Gillette, King James Gillette. Yeah, I know. Who was a corporate socialist by, you know, avowed. Mm-hmm. He was an avowed corporate socialist who thought that the corporation would become one and it would be totalizing. It would include everything, all production, and it would be the state simultaneously. This was a vision in 1910. Isn't that, Is it, yeah. isn't that the difference between national socialism and global communism is part of it is mm-hmm. that's nation yeah. and as opposed to gold a uh, goal mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, global yeah. but it is also they don't necessarily take the property mm-hmm. they allow these companies yes, to still right. own you still own the company that's right but we're going to dictate what you're doing. Not all the times, but we can come in and say, no, you're going to make this. I think it's more like, in the United States, it's more like a kind of a a deal making. It's like, if you do this, we'll do that. If you do this, if you do this, we'll do that. You know, right. we, it's no just, antitrust uh, legislation if you do this. This is the third time I thought about this since we were sitting down here. Um, so let me just say it so it's out of my mind. <laughs> um you know, if, if I've heard people joking, not jokingly, some people are serious about it. You know, I heard it with Bill Clinton. You know, Bill Clinton, he's, I bet he's the Antichrist. Stop with this. Yeah, right. Stop That's a this, little okay? grandizement for yeah, him. Okay. He doesn't deserve you know, it. <laughs> Barack Obama or, or Donald Trump or the Pope or whatever. Yeah. First of all, the Antichrist, if there is an Antichrist that's coming. Yeah. He's going to be so damn slick. You're not going to be. He's not coming, he's not coming the up. way you think he's going to come. He's not going to look evil. <clears throat> right. And that's the same thing. Hugo Boss 
is the one who designed the Nazi uniforms. It was Hugo Boss. Wow. So when you see those black SS uniforms, we now think they look scary. Uh, mm-hmm. Come up with the black boots. No. They were fashion they statements. Were, it was a fashion <laughs> statement. It looked great when it right. came. So everything that is coming now mm-hmm. doesn't look like what you expect it to look like. Exactly. That's it's, the scare. It's coming, it's coming in, in ease in everything that you want. Yeah. Everything that you and want. And it's coming dressed in rhetoric that sounds wonderful. Right. Equity, diversity, and inclusion. You know, all these high, noble-sounding abstractions, which who could disagree with? Right. But the problem is, what is really, what is really that language being used to, 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 to paper over? What, what are they trying to use that language as a scrim to cover for? We were founded on the individual, and our First Amendment really covers that. Mm -hmm. I have a right to conscience, Mm -hmm. okay? I don't have to do, I don't, as an individual, I don't have to believe what you tell me to believe, and I can say whatever I believe. We're built on that. Everything that's happening now is the exact opposite of that. Yeah, right. Tell you just a funny story. <laughs> this is just funny story. It's recent. Last not, last night I got a I got a hotel room because I, I went back to Connecticut, came back, and I went to this place in Chinatown, and they said, uh, you know, it's about a three and a half star hotel. Okay, I'll deal with it for now. And I go in, and they say you'll be in a dormitory with ten other men. And I said, no, I won't. What? And she said, yes, you will. And I said, no, I don't have to stay here. This isn't <laughs> China yet. Goodbye. And anyway, so just to say, you know. Just this idea that I would have to do it, you know. But that's where we're headed. Yeah. And 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 I don't. Uh, and just because it's a corporation, mm-hmm. uh, if the government is is backed by this corporation, mm-hmm. or the government backs the corporation, mm-hmm. there's no but there's no police to run to. No. They're, they're, they're have, they're between them, they're in you know, some sort of hand-in-glove sort of situation, and between them, there's, there's no way to get, uh, to pry them apart, and, and there's, no outside, there's nothing outside of them that, that can intervene. So can you, take, can you take the average person and say, okay, you know what your life is like today, mm-hmm. but five years, ten years, however long it takes yeah. for this to come. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes sooner rather than later. But yeah. we could be wrong on on uh, the timing. Mm-hmm. But if we don't wake up, I don't think we're wrong on what's coming. Yeah. So what? how does the average person's life change? How are they, ex- how are they affected? Well, I mean, if, this, you know, there seems to be a race between American or U.S. and Chinese AI implementation, right? And as you were talking about recently, I think it was a day or so, or maybe yesterday, about what if uh, you know five G, whoever really develops five G first mm-hmm. and and, uh, and and connects it with their AI potential, they are going to win this race. Okay, explain explain five G for people don't don't understand. Well, it's 5G. just going to be a massively, incredibly. Fast, almost instantaneous internet with uh, a gigantic pipe, tons it's, of it's, uh, gargantuan bytes, you know, yeah. and instant data transfer. Like it's like, you know, there's no latency. To nothing, it. and yeah. uh, and it'll be, and so the reason why we don't have self-driving cars right now, yeah, is because we don't have five G. That's right. There's not enough bandwidth to handle it. Right, because it's to have a self-driving car. We think of self-driving cars as having these cameras and right. these sensors, but mm-hmm. when it's connected to 5G, yeah. and this is where it really gets scary, when yeah. it's connected to 5G, it will know who's in, literally, who is in the car next to you oh, yeah. and all around you, and it's mm-hmm. constantly calculating. It's taking that information packet of how that driver even drives. Yes. Uh, and if you're going to be in an accident, mm-hmm. which one should I, should I go mow down the, the person on the sidewalk or should I mow down this oh, person that, over that, here? That dilemma, yeah. Yeah, I mean, right. it's going to have that kind of information mm-hmm. with no latency and That's it's right. constantly going to be calculated. And so, and so basically the way I put it is that, you know, we go on the internet now, right? Yeah. It's going to be a very quaint anachronism very soon. 
You'll be in the internet, of course. So what's the difference between that and the Matrix? Nothing. Except that your body's not underground serving as a battery to fuel <laughs> to fuel it. Right. You're actually here walking around, but your data and you're, you're digitalized. You're in the matrix, but you're physically here in the matrix, you know. So, I mean, this, is, this means that basically we're going to be in ambient cyberspace. Cyberspace will be all space. I mean, you know, you could go to the Grand Canyon and you'll still be in cyberspace. It will be very rarely places that escape this kind of complete surrounding sur uh, cyber uh, space. So, I mean, it would be like being bathed in it, in effect. So uh, you're in it, you're not going into so it. So explain to me the difference of, <clears throat> like right now, mm -hmm. I'm in a studio, your phone's working, my phone's working, mm -hmm. we have internet, it's, we're in it, it's all around it us. It is. So what's the difference? The difference is that there'll be, there'll be uh, CTV cameras, there'll be... Um, many more devices for, for gathering information and sending it to different authorities or depending mm -hmm. on what, what the data is. Co you know, obviously collecting it, connecting it to you, and then, of course, connecting algorithms to you to predict your behaviors so that, in fact, you could be followed because th they have decided that based on a certain pattern, you're going to do something illegal in any minute. And as long as... Uh uh, until the point to where we have augmented reality as yeah. part of everyday life and our yeah. glasses, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. When that happens, you mm -hmm. will then be easily nudged mm -hmm. visually. Yes. Um, like we are now when we're using our, our apps, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking for a place to eat. We go to Yelp and we find it and it shows us how to get there. Yeah. We'll be, we can be nudged. Mm -hmm. And also all the, all these, every build, you know, Google Glasses was to, supposed to give you information about everything you looked at, right? Mm -hmm. This will, this will be happening. It'll be just way more information. And, it, you know, who knows what it really, what kind of information it's going to be. It, it's interesting being um, somewhat famous. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the disadvantage is people think they know me. Mm hmm and yeah. I don't know them at all. Yeah. But they think they know I've heard me. that from people. That, yeah. Like Bob Dylan said that about it, being famous. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Yeah. It's really weird. Um, but they don't really know you. Yeah. Now, we're all kind of going this through this with Facebook, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You're not really showing who you really are on yeah, right. Facebook. You right. know, it's right. you're getting this snapshot. And even right. if it's an accurate snapshot, it's only one snapshot. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, the... the um, the information that will be coming in front of your eyes mm -hmm. will be that same information that could be skewed mm -hmm. one way or another. You'll have a living kind of Wikipedia that's feeding your glasses or yes, your eyes. That's right. This is who this man is. Right. Danger. And, and, and we know now that this, these, you know, like Google itself, is not a neutral information source. Mm -hmm. It has an agenda. So why would we imagine that agenda wouldn't be spread into the entire cyberspace when it's now everywhere mm -hmm. and so being in the being in the cyber being in the internet means that um it means a lot of things it means that <laughs> that that everything we do is almost everything e even things inside residences will be known mm -hmm. uh, but um <laughs> everybody will be pretty much a, a known quantity in effect uh, data wise and uh it's the surveillance, it's, it's like, I talk about this, you know, and, and I'll throw this out there for, for the leftists. Mm -hmm. uh, Michel Foucault, who was a postmodern theorist, wrote this uh, book called Discipline and Punish in 1975, and he talked about this thing called panopticism, which mm -hmm. I talk about in my first chapter. Panopticons. The panopticon was invented by Bentham, Jeremy Bentham, the, the 19th century philosophical radical. Mm -hmm. He was actually a leftist. Mm -hmm. But Foucault took his idea of this uh, prison system in which there's a central tower, and you're in these cells surrounding it. You can't look into the tower to see if the guard is in there, but they can look in to see if you're in the cell. Right. Every single cell, it's it's like a it's like a chimney with all of a round chimney yeah. with all of the cells on the outside. Right. And then in the, the center, center is, is the, the eye. Yes. Now the thing is about this is that you don't know if you're being observed or not, but mm -hmm. Because of the possibility of being observed at all times, you become your own surveiller. Mm -hmm. You become your own 
Well, he puts it, you become the principle of your own subjection. It used to be, it used to be God. That's right. Used to be God. Used to be God. That's where the conscience comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, like I I wrote a paper about uh, Milton's Paradise Lost and talked about how God was the panoptic guard. And then because we thought, you know, he could see, because he can see, and I believe we can, he can see into our -hmm. minds, that we do, you know, basically act accordingly or not. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, conscience comes from that. Well, this is a kind of reinstalled technologically, you know, God produced God. There's a there's a sect of uh, technology people in uh, Silicon Valley who mm-hmm. I'm not sure if they're serious or they're just trying to make a point, but they have built a church yes. for the the AI God because well, they yeah. say. A SI super yes. intelligence is going to be so godlike yes. that we will worship it. Kurzweil, you know, who became, mm. you know, who who might have been taken for a total crank for oh, yeah. a while, but he wasn't. Oh no, I <laughs> know. Now he's of course a chief senior engineer yeah. at Google. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he his envision was that the God didn't make the universe. The universe will make God vis a vis human technology mm-hmm. so that the universe will, he calls it, all the dumb matter of the universe will be saturated with knowledge and it'll wake up and it'll be omniscient because they'll, it'll know everything that there is to know that mm-hmm. makes it omniscient, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it'll be God. We'll, and so instead of God creating the universe, the universe creates God and this is the singularity. Now, I don't think it's going to be such a religious, wonderful, mystical experience as that. No. <laughs> I don't think no. it's that way. I don't think that's no, the way it's going to go. because God is still programmed, at least initially, by, by flawed people, humans. Flawed and, 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 and driven. In, yeah. Interested and, uh, yeah. and biased. The, the, and, uh, the, the worst thing I've heard um, Mark Zuckerberg or any of these guys say is that we have a responsibility to make the world a better place. No, you don't. No, you don't. Not as a corporation with no, that kind well, of that's power. Right. Yeah, that's right. You have a, a responsibility to produce your product yeah. that people want. Right. The minute you start to say, and you know what? We, this could change the world because mm-hmm. we can help shape it. Mm-hmm. You're in very evil, dangerous You're in territory. A totally different register totally different and this is what i i talk about this in the book in this first chapter it's called woke capitalism and what is going on with this you know this this woke corporate um mentality or you ethos. gave me a totally different view of of what was going on explain woke capitalism okay well it is you know we, we've seen many instances of it you know like the advertisements you know for example the gillette ad speaking of gillette where the ma- toxic masculinity was you know mm-hmm. Uh, derided, and you know these guys are looking into the mirror, not to shave, but to to rue and and try to excise from their psyche this horrible toxic masculinity, you know. Mm-hmm. And then there's these scenes going on in which all these men are doing these terrible things: predation on women, mm-hmm. uh, you know, mansplaining, uh, mm-hmm. you know, which means you know, guy telling, mm-hmm. actually talking, <laughs> <laughs> guy talking when a woman is in a room, right. that's the mansplaining, right, um, right. Things like that, and it just was this whole, you know, this this whole moral uh, rhetoric and this whole moral story they were trying to uh, purvey about how men should be, right? Mm-hmm. They even say, do the right thing, say the right thing, the right thing. And um, so this, you know, and then the cap Say the, the right, right thing. thing. Think and of that. The right thing. Not mm-hmm. our right thing, the. So that's very explicit. Uh, and then, of course, the Kaepernick ad, and and then you have all of these uh, corporations that are just chiming in to prove how virtuous they are, right? Nike and the Betsy Ross sneakers. Yeah. So, I mean, my my question was, what is going on here? Okay. So, first of all, it's it's the it's corporations embracing contemporary leftism. Now, anybody that knows the history of left and corporate. America knows that it's been one of nothing but contention. So why are they now in a love embrace? Okay, mm-hmm. this is what tortured me, not tortured, but mm-hmm. it taunted me a bit. Mm-hmm. I thought I had to figure this out. This was mm-hmm. a puzzle. 
And so, so going deeply into it, looking at it, and really trying to analyze it, I think that it's very clear that it's not just a marketing ploy. It is not just a a way to assuage their customer base, to be, you know, placate uh, diverse uh, peoples. It is part of their real agenda, Mm -hmm. and it suits their perfect, their aims perfectly. Um, And Gillette, I mean, I've studied the history of Gillette now, going all the way back to the beginning. They had an ad in 1905 that had a baby boy shaving himself to to say to the public, that you shouldn't be shaved by someone else because that's a form of putting them into slavery for you. In 1905? Yes. Oh, I have to see that ad. It's that's nuts. crazy. It's in the book. Crazy. 1905, a Gillette ad. It said, um, so I forget what the, term, what, what the uh, byline is on the ad, but it's basically start immediately shaving yourself. And it, and it's, it seems kind of crazy to put a, a, a razor blade in the hands of an infant, but <laughs> I mean, I thought, what are they trying to kill the kid, or are they suggesting right. they should right. slice, slice, cut their throats? But no, they were saying that they want to train you early not to depend on others. You know, use, people used to go to the barber to get a shave, mm-hmm. right? The, the idea was now be self sufficient, not only because it's self reliance and all that. No, it's so that you're not putting anyone else at your service. He's already starting this kind of social justice moralizing from the start. And, of course, he wrote a book called World Corporation in, that, mm-hmm. in 1910, in, in which he talked about the corporation that expands and subsumes all other corporations and finally becomes the singular monopoly of the entire globe and that the seems, government at once. Seems like Google. Yes. That's what I'm trying to hint at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but – and it only really could work with this kind of technology. It takes the digital world to make that possible. It's, it takes digital digitalization and high speed high high speed internet to to create a world corporation or a world system. You know, it's a it's a it's a amazing to me that um, all of the things. I grew up Catholic. I went to a Catholic school. And, Me uh, too. Did you? Yeah. So you learned. I went to a seminary. Wow. Yes. So, I was in a monastery. <laughs> so you had to have learned about you know Book of Revelation. Oh yes. And all of that stuff seemed like that's never going to happen. That's mm-hmm. just never. There's no way. Mm-hmm. No currency. You know, everybody's got a number yeah. that you won't be able to buy certain goods without the mark. I tell you, isn't that incredible? It's incredible. That's incredible. I mean, to me, well, you know what I think. Yeah. To me, that that just says you know, there's there's no way a human being could have known that. Yeah. Right. So I mean, this right. this is divine inspiration. And it, yeah, and it's and, and 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 there's not a wasted word. No, and it's it's there's no way any of that could have happened. Not that you know, in not that, then. That era, and no. I don't know of any other time that that could have happened. Even you know, this is you know, Hitler had the IBM punch cards. That's right. You know, and so IBM was right there going, uh, "We can help you sort people." Yes, they um, were, but. That technology is, when we uh, get rid of currency, mm-hmm. which I could have, I would have said 30 years ago, we're not going to get rid of currency. Mm-hmm. Well, we're there. I, yeah. I haven't carried yeah. a dollar in my wallet and I don't know how long. You know what I mean? Yeah, I only do for tips, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you're sitting here. You're not using currency right. at all already. Right. You can get rid of currency quite easily. Easily. And once you do, the, the thing that people have not talked about uh, is what New York State, what the governor of New York is doing to uh, get around the Second Amendment. He's saying to the banks, you know, we have to do an audit of you every year. We have to send in our Fed regulators to just do an audit. And I'm paraphrasing, we can do this the hard way, we can do this the easy way. Mm -hmm. We feel Mm -hmm. that any of these corporations or any of these groups that are building or selling guns, that will kick you into a more extensive audit. So we would just suggest that you don't do business. 
And you're seeing these these giant banks say, "I'm not going to do business." That's right. It'll go anymore. down, and it'll go to the individual too. Right. An uh, individual right. makes a Facebook post in support of the Second Amendment, and you know the bank sees it, which they can obviously, and that's it. You know, well, they you're could already be- having you're already having people um, that are speaking out. I mean, people that used to advise presidents about Islam Mm -hmm. uh, and know the difference between a Muslim and an Islamist. Yeah. Um, Those people have already been not only deplatformed, their voices silenced, but they also can't use certain banking systems. Uh, They can't use credit cards. They can't use certain banks because the banks won't accept it because they've been marked. Yes. It's terrifying prospect. I mean, you know, I'm not talking just about myself. I'm talking about anybody. I mean, you know, just to see, to see, you know, like, uh, for example, you talked about homeless people. How will they eat? I mean, you know, we're, you can't even give them money. If, it, if everything's digital, there's no way to even help people like that. So it's a very curious problem. I want to go back to something we touched on earlier, but um, I want to hear you talk more about the concept of nudge, which we've gone through. Mm-hmm. But... Talk about it in a way of the philosophical argument on free will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really, well, you know, this is a big issue already, a problem in philosophy, of course. And, you know, determinism is of, you know, determinism is really the, the ruling, per, you know, belief amongst most philosophers mm-hmm. today. There's no such thing as will. It's just an illusion. Um we get this idea that we 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 decide on things, but it's really mm-hmm. it's really deterministic, like anything else mm-hmm. in nature. Every you know, there's always a cause for every action, right? So we're just we're just billiard balls on the table, mm-hmm. if you will, mm-hmm. and we're getting knocked around. Mm-hmm. We think we're doing it out of our own volition, but no, that's basically the philosophical line, you know, for the most part, in the dominance. And uh, and when you see. Companies like the, I can't remember his name. He's a professor up at Harvard, yeah. well respected guy, mm-hmm. Hillary Clinton voter, um, who is ringing the bell so hard saying, Google is manipulating the elections. They did it in 16. Oh, yeah. He I've, said they're remember. much worse yes, in 18. I, I this, yeah. I and he just... said in 2020, yeah. it, it, it could be a total uh, skewing yeah. of this election because they're so good and no one even will recognize that they're right. being manipulated. They, they won't know because they're going to be, I mean, you said nudging. Well, they're going to have, pred, everybody has predilections and beliefs, and these are going to be read. You know, they're going to be read like, you know, an open book now. And so using those predilections and those, you know, uh, desires or, you know, tendencies and so forth, this just, let me just get you a little bit closer with another little dark ad that says, da 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 da, da you know. Hillary Clinton is this, or uh, Trump is that, and just just a little bit closer to the side, and, and on and on, and and it's not going to go towards Trump, okay? No. <laughs> it's going to go towards the Democratic side, and they're going to dis- you know they're going to disappear stories and uh, that are positive, and the- I I had one of my researchers. I actually I looked for something. Um, I was looking for a picture. I saw Trump's first campaign rally mm-hmm. for his second term. Mm-hmm. And and I remember the first campaign rally of Barack Obama mm-hmm. on his second term. Mm-hmm. Second term. Mm-hmm. It was an empty stadium. Wow. And they had to shoot it differently. And because I worked at Fox that was willing to turn the camera around, mm-hmm. I saw a very different picture. And I know there were pictures of this everywhere. Wow. So I wanted to do something on the passion behind the Donald Trump people. Mm-hmm. In his second term, Mm -hmm. which no president has had like Trump has, even Obama. And I wanted to show those pictures. I looked for two hours on Google. I tried everything I could to get those pictures in. It took my, my, the deepest uh, mole that I have, a guy who knows the internet inside and out and just is a mole. Yeah. I called him at nine o'clock at night and said, "Can you find? Can you find these pictures?" And he's like, "Oh, I know exactly why. I remember seeing them. I yes. know exactly." Three a.m. He finally got them. Oh yeah, three a.m. Did he call you? That's <laughs> yeah. he, he called me at five a.m. because <laughs> okay, I, yeah. I got the update. Yeah, but it is. It's 
that's how hard most people would say. I guess it didn't exist. It's v, you're going to have to deep, you know, uh, you know, dark web, deep VPN, all that. I think uh, basically where these things are going to be hidden uh, to keep it out of Google's pur purview, you know, because otherwise or purview, they'll otherwise can totally control it. So I, I don't like the dark web, and I don't want to be a part of it. I don't like. I don't either. I don't want to go like in the. I like I don't like to travel in the dirt, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. and so I don't do it. But I think that's where the stuff of those kind of pieces of information will be found. It's a black market. Yeah, and it's it, it's um, black markets are always caused by governments or institutions that are out of touch with either human nature mm -hmm. or society that, in yeah, general. That's right. I just read a story about. Um, New Zealand and you know their gun ban and mm. that thing was passed so fast only one representative in their parliament stood against it only one okay it's like 99 to 1 or 100 mm -hmm. and something to 1 do you know how many guns have been collected 1.5 million guns they said they have how many guns have been collected since that was passed months ago. They said they had 1.5 million. 1.5 million in the, the country. The country. Okay. Well, I, I would know. guess that there were actually 5 to 10 million. That's my guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> but how many have they collected oh. since they passed that? I don't know. 700. Duh. That's how out of touch. They are with the facts. With the are, they are with the people. Yeah. The people who have the guns are like, I'm not turning that in. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. I'm not turning that in. Right. So what they've effectively done is they've made everyone a criminal. Mm -hmm. And now they're talking about you have to come in and register your gun, mm -hmm. you know, or it'll be a felony. Well, now, wait a minute. So, wait, I didn't turn in my gun. Mm -hmm. And so I have to come to you to admit that I didn't turn in my gun to register my gun. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, it's a felony. You're just piling up criminal charges. Let me just give you a little historical context for this. Lenin, after, you know, the revolution, and by 1918, was already saying, kill all those kulaks, hang them and burn them and tell their families and publicize it in the paper. I mean, he was a, a he was the monster. Butcher, a monster. And then he said, confiscate all guns. All guns. So I mean, this is just it's just par for the course. Every dictator says that. Yeah. Every dictator says that. Yeah. Which should tell you something about our founders that were saying never confiscate guns. Never gun. confiscate guns. Right. Never give up your gun. And I'm not some gun freak. What yeah. I am talking about is just, uh, it's about rights. It's about mm -hmm. like the the rights we were we were endowed mm -hmm. and the rights that we need to protect our rights that we were endowed. And one of them is that, I think. So can I ask for your philosophic um, and ethical viewpoint on this? Yeah. Um, I've interviewed Ray Kurzweil several times, mm, and I that's curious. I love him. He's smart, and I am terrified by him. Mm -hmm. I, it took me seven years to get my first interview with him. I started in the mid '90s trying to get an interview with mm -hmm. him after I read *The Age of Spiritual Machines*. I read that. Okay, um, and that is eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And at the time, everybody said he's crazy; Nuts. it'll never happen. Oh, I believed it from the minute I started reading yeah. that. And that's what we're headed towards. Yeah, um, the age where a machine is going to say, "Don't, I'm lonely." That's right. And it's it's going to change our relationship. You know, they're talking now about, and I will have a point to this, but I want to take you th on this journey here with me and get your your thoughts mm -hmm. as we go. Yeah, um, we have these people now saying. You know, sex robots, yes. better than sex, sex workers, bots. sex bots, blah, right. blah, blah. Uh, I heard one um, uh, one psychiatrist on, uh, I think it was Joe Rogan, mm -hmm. that was talking about how pedophiles, it might be good to give pedophiles these children robots uh, to molest, so they, y yada, yada, yada. And I'm, I'm listening to this in my car, and I'm shouting, no! <laughs> The minute those things, and it's going to happen, yeah. claim consciousness, mm -hmm. are we not slave owners? Well, that's there's a very big question there. The, the, the question is if they're if they are endowed, if they do have consciousness, 
funny funny thing is, as we're going to be considered having no will, they are going to be considered as having, having a will. Right. You know, I mean, I forget the guy who wrote The Shallows, a great book, mm -hmm. about how what's happening is we're we're becoming artificial intelligence and machines are becoming more human. Yes. So we're going opposite, opposite direction. directions. So right. Uh, machines becoming sentient, human right. beings becoming robotic. Right. So um, what defines life? What? How are we going to... Nobody's even talking about that, and I think we could be 10 years away from that. Yeah. What, what defines life? Ray Kurzweil says, just a pattern of you know, of your brain. That's that's all you are. It's just a pattern of how you think. I can reproduce that. I can store that. I can download it into a machine. Mm -hmm. His exact quote to me is, no one will ever die. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that's not life. Yeah. Okay. But if you don't believe in a spirit, if mm -hmm. you don't believe in a divine spark, what's I, life? I, 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 think, I think it is this. To do something that is not rational, that is not self-interested, that doesn't make sense, that follows no algorithms, that has no purpose in terms of the worldly value system, mm -hmm. and defies it, that will prove you're not a robot. That will prove you're a living thing, a sentient being mm -hmm. with, who is endowed with a will and a spirit because you will resist this whole shebang. And this is what I get into in the conclusion of the book. I'm not talking about revolution, take over Google. We must storm, you know, Google, we must mm -hmm. overcome mm -hmm. and we take over the information mm -hmm. uh, means of production. That'll be a worse nightmare mm -hmm. because then we'll have uh, totalitarians that want to kill uh, mm -hmm. uh, people instead of just people that want to control. They, they want to mm -hmm. kill the controllers and it'll be a new set of oligarchs mm -hmm. anyway. So it's a spiritual situation, in my opinion. It's a spiritual situation. It's a situation in which they're going to be purveying narratives to greater and greater extents with more data to back them up, which means they're going to be harder to, harder to resist, harder to, to deny, mm -hmm. you know, and harder to um, overcome, harder to have a prerogative different from that. And so I think the battle is in the soul. Mm -hmm. I know. I think it's actually in the soul. Mm -hmm. uh, call me a crank, if you will. I don't care. Because that's where I think it's the only thing that's... The only thing is the... You, is they're going to be telling you who you are, what you are, what you're going to do, all these things, and predicting it. And, and one is going to have to draw from some other source that isn't theirs, that isn't their narrative. My father said the two most powerful words in any language is I am. Mm -hmm. um, that's what God said to Moses, mm -hmm. I am that I am. Mm -hmm. Shall I say, send me, I am that I mm -hmm. am. And he, he warned me, he said, if you don't intentionally fill the blank in after the words, I am, mm -hmm. the world is full of people that will fill it in for you. Yes. And when you look at what uh, Common Core, what Bill Gates said, that his vision is for Common Core, and we're close to this now, not right. necessarily in Common Core, but the actual scanning of the eye. Mm -hmm. Once they once they can look into your eyes, they can predict almost anything. They mm -hmm. will know more about you that way yeah. than any other way. Mm -hmm. um, and his point was, we're going to have those cameras mm -hmm. right on the screens mm -hmm. so it can look into the kids so we can then sort them mm -hmm and show them exactly what business line they should be trained for. It's mm -hmm. basically training robots to yes. go out into the world and feed business. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, what, we'll be able to show them where they need to go. Well, that's the company or an algorithm filling in the blank of I Yeah, I mean, this, this was already in 2010, there was, a, there was a conference at NYU, and it was called Your Brain on Google. And the idea was, you're not going to have to go searching on some computer or phone or anything like that. You're just going to be connected to Google. It'll be an implant in your brain, and you'll be on the web. You know, picking up different. And so the thing is, every, every server 
or every every servant, as they call it in computer technology, they're servants with the ENT, and they're servers. Every servant is also a server. That means that everybody's brain, if it is in fact on the web, will be open information. Mm -hmm. It'll be it'll be some if there's a way to translate it into into it's a collective into a it's language. A yeah. It's a hive. Yes. Mind. But they'll have to have a way to translate the thinking or mm -hmm. consciousness into a language that is readable by the machine mm -hmm. and then translatable to the human. But that's very, it's, I mean, so I say that I think consciousness is going to be, not only that we're going to be, the internet, we're not going to be just bathed in it, it's going to be in our heads, mm -hmm. and it's going to be able to tap it's into transhumanism. Our, yeah, transhumanism. And anybody who thinks that's crazy, that was the first chapter in, I don't remember which book from Al Gore, mm -hmm. but one of his big, you know, yeah. one of his big books, it was all about transhumanism. Yeah. People don't understand. That's why Stephen Hawking said at the end of his life, I don't think humans will exist by 2050. Mm -hmm. He didn't mean that we would die out. Right. He meant that we would be augmented. That's right. Supplanted and, uh, right. by a successor species. So what happens to, again, this comes to the, the life uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. um, you're augmented. Mm -hmm. um, you're You've already been shaped yeah. by somebody telling you who you're mm -hmm. supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, then you're augmented. When I asked Ray Kurzweil, what if I just wanted to be human? <laughs> he, he looked at me like I was from another planet. Yeah, why said, would you want that? Yeah, That's exactly what he said. Yeah. Why would you want that? And I yeah. said, I don't know, because I like the mistakes. He said, well, <sighs> there it is. Yeah, the mistakes. Mistakes. Yes. I, I learn from those. I grow from those. That's one. And he said, uh, well, no one will do that because, uh, first of all, you won't be able to survive. You won't be uh, able to compete. to compete. Yeah. And you will actually, as I thought about this more and more, you'll actually be a danger mm -hmm. to other people because you'll be so slow. Incompetent, yeah. You know, you'll be like a real bad driver on the highway correct. going 30 miles an hour in a speedway. Exactly right. Yeah. You will be so slow that yeah. you will be an obstacle. The society will have to remove you mm -hmm. and either force you to upgrade or force you to live over here. Yeah. Does that seem reasonable to you, logical? <laughs> I mean, no, I'm just talking yeah, right. logical on the pathways that we're yeah, on. Yeah, that sounds right. You know, and if he was a, a nut... You know, if it was all crazy, and I read The Singularity is Near, and I was reading all this stuff while I was working in the Robotics Institute, and I asked these programmers, you know, what do you think of Kurzweil? Ah, oh, he's a crank. Don't even talk. Don't even think about it. Don't worry about it. That's not what we're dealing with. They said, you know, AI was just going to be distributed intelligence, mm -hmm. little pieces of software passing along information to other little pieces and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, distributed in, uh, intelligence is what it was called. Agents. Agent uh, technology. But then Google hired the guy and is investing who knows how many millions mm -hmm. into billions. singularity te technology. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't just do that unless there's something there. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, this is, this, this is not craziness. This mm -hmm. is real stuff. They're doing it. And I think most scientists believe that uh, it may be on the horizon. They just think that he's too optimistic now. Yeah, but well, he moves his the goalposts back, you know, know. But, but he's also consistently right on a lot of things. A lot of things. Yeah, a lot. He of predicted things. a lot of things. There's no question. He's he's done some incredible technologies. For example, uh, OCR technology is his. Uh, you know, being able to you know scan that thing and then mm -hmm. turn it back into words from mm -hmm. the picture. I mean, he's, uh, yeah, he's the guy's, a, the guy's he's brilliant. Really yeah. I mean, he's brilliant. So doesn't mean he's his directionality is proper, right? Yeah. So let me go back to it's the spirit. Yeah. Okay. Two things on this. I, I think I have evidence that that is true. Um, because do you remember the, the, um, Microsoft, I think it was Microsoft program that could tweet for you. You would mm. feed in all of the tweets mm. and then it would know you and mm -hmm. then it would start tweeting. Mm -hmm. And at the first, on first day number one, mm -hmm. people were amazed because it was exactly what they would have said. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 
By day five, they had to shut it down because it was so nasty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I thought to myself, that that's what super intelligence just may be, because it is the it's the God governor, mm -hmm. usually. Mm -hmm. It's the conscience that makes you say, I don't want to be that way. I don't Isn't I shouldn't go down this road. And it corrects. So you'll learn, you'll do something that'll make you feel bad or it gives you bad consequences and you correct. But if if you don't have that certain something that brings you say, you shouldn't be doing this, you're just gonna go over the cliff. I mean, that's the problem. You have, there. there is a, a type of mentality and it, you know, it's in Dostoevsky's uh, Crime and Punishment, the character, uh, uh, I forget his name. Anyway, the character, the main character thinks he's super moral. He's a superman, and he has the right to decide what, to, you know, whether this woman, this pawnbroker can live or die. So he decides that she's worthless and actually evil, and so he kills her. And that is his choice, and there's something about genius that allows uh, complete, you know, a supervention of, of morality. Mm -hmm. And this, this is the issue I think you're getting at here is that supreme intelligence like this will think that it knows whether or not it can do anything at all. And it's mm -hmm. no reason to obey any morality of anybody mm -hmm. who's underneath it intelligence wise. So will the, is the answer here, much of the West currently, it seems, runs on wealth of nations, mm. Adam Smith, and mm -hmm. not moral sentiments. Theory of moral sentiments. I was just mentioning that, that you're one of the very few people who knows that book outside of a university in an 18th century class. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Everybody should know that. Everybody should know every, it. It's, it's every single person. I'm told the number one, the number one problem at Wharton School of Business now is, you know, they'll lay out a case study mm -hmm. and they'll say, okay, was this right or wrong? And there's no basis for determining it. And they, the, the, the number one question from the whole class is, did it make money? Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm not asking you that. Yeah. I'm asking you, is this right or wrong? Yeah. There is no moral sentiment. There is mm -hmm. no governor. There is right. no reason. There's no way to determine right or wrong because there is no right or wrong. But the thing is that Adam Smith was pointing out is it cannot be a supervenient state. It has to be implanted in the self. Right. And that's where it comes from. It comes from you. You see another person suffering, and that causes you to behave differently. Mm -hmm. You know, it is not about an overseer, right? So that's what's beautiful about the theory of, uh, of, theory of moral sentiments. It is a, is a co... It, it, it's a co-recognition of each other's rights and each other's um, needs and each other's... Um, relate you know relationships to each mm -hmm. other like how we're how we're connected and all that so and it's done it's done through visuality i mean he talks about you know it's a lot of visual recognition right the eye, eyesight is a big part of mm -hmm. um of this i don't mean necessarily physical eyesight but it is the acknowledgement seeing. of others it's right? seeing the homeless person right. not it's, walking by them right actually acknowledging and seeing mm -hmm. and feeling something in connection with that Percy Shelley wrote a very similar thing in the uh, in the, the de a defense of poetry, in which he said that uh, without sympathy, or without imagination, you can't have sympathy. And without sympathy, you can have you cannot have morality. So you have to be able to imagine what it's like to be in someone else's mm -hmm. shoes in order to be sympathy. moral toward them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but it, you know, this. But the thing to you know that I want to emphasize here, and I, it's a great book to bring up is that it's done on the individual level and it's not superimposed by anybody. It's done on the individual level and the, the secret here is, is that because we are a collection of individuals, mm -hmm. that will create the invisible hand. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if we're good people as individuals, mm -hmm. we are gonna create good things. The, yeah, the if invisible hand will be spanking us or you know, strangling us. Right, or giving yeah. us heroin. Right. You know? It, it, it will give you, it's the internet. It's mm -hmm. neither good nor bad. It's who we are. 
You know, better people would use this for discovery and 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 learning. That's right. All of this, we're using it for porn. I That's, said the, I said the same thing. I said in the book, it's 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 not so much the state of the art as it is the state of the world, mm. and um, because the state of the art doesn't necessarily determine. You know, there are technological determinists out there, and they're very rife now. There's a ton of them that think. They think that actually we have no control of technology at all. It's almost autonomously developing itself, in effect, parallel to our existence, and that we can't really change it. It's going to. There's no way around it. There's this kind of inevitability idea that there's no way to stop this progress or whatever you want to call it of technology. It's almost self-motivating, autonomous, and so forth. But I don't. I don't buy it. And also, I don't. I don't buy that it's. Uh, that it has to be uh, pernicious in its use. You shared uh, your book with me. I want to share, not my book, I want to share something with you that Wonderful. I asked you about, and you said you had not heard of it, nobody has. <laughs> and you are going to be one of the few people that I've ever shared this with that will go, oh my gosh. Thank you. I feel privileged. Uh, Rudyard Kipling, mm -hmm. he saw World War I come. Right. He heard all the arguments. He said, this is insanity. Right. The world is going insane. Right. Um, and he, he visited graveyards for the rest of his life and serviced service people's graves for the rest of his life. He wrote a poem after World War I, and it's all been but erased. Mm -hmm. um, and he wrote it as a warning yeah. to future generations. Listen, listen to this. Okay. It's called the gods of the copybook headings. Copybook headings are those things that were used in school where it said, you know, water will wet or God is good. And it was in cursive and you would copy I that. See. Okay? Yeah. So everything at the top were truths. I see. Truisms that you yeah. copied and then Correct. learned how to emulate. Right. Okay. Okay, great. As I pass through my incarnations in every age and race, I make my proper prostrations to the gods of the marketplace. Peering through reverent fingers, I watch them flourish and fall. And the gods of the copybook headings, I notice, outlast them all. We were living in the trees when they met us. They showed us each in turn that water would certainly wet us as fire would certainly burn. But we found them lacking in uplift, vision, and breadth of mind. So we left them to teach the gorillas while we followed the march of mankind. As we moved, we moved as the spirit listed. They never altered their pace, being neither cloud nor windborne like the gods of the marketplace. But they always caught up with our progress, and presently word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice field or the lights had gone out in Rome. With the hopes that our world was is built on that they were utterly out of touch. After all, they denied the moon was Stilton. They denied she was even Dutch. They denied that wishes were horses. They denied that pigs had wings. So we worshiped the gods of the market who promised us all these beautiful things. When the Cambrian shores were forming, they promised us perpetual peace. They swore if we just gave them our weapons the wars of the tribes would cease. But when we disarmed, they sold us and delivered us bound to our foe. And the gods of the copybook heading said, stick to the devil you know. On the first feminine sandstones, we were promised a fuller life, which started out by loving our neighbor and ended by loving his wife till all of our women had no more children and our men lost reason and faith. And the gods of the copybook heading said, the wages of sin is death. In the Carboniferous epic, we were promised abundance for all by robbing selected Peter to pay for collective Paul. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy. And the gods of the copybook heading said, if you do not work you shall die. Then the gods of the market tumbled, and their smooth tongued wizards withdrew, and the hearts of the meanest were humbled, and began to believe it were true. 
that all is not gold that glitters, and two and two do make four, and the gods of the copybook headings limped up to explain it once more. As it will be in the future, it was at the birth of man. There are only four things certain since social progress began. That the dog returns to his vomit and the sow returns to her mire and the burnt fool's bandaged finger goes wobbling back to the fire. And after all of this is accomplished and the brave new world begins, when all men are paid for existing and no man must pay for his sins, as surely as water will wet us, as surely as fire will burn, the gods of the copybook headings with terror and slaughter return. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Is that one of the greatest It's things? incredible. That's incredible. Incredible. I mean, the, 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 prof- the prophecy the of prophecy. it. The prophecy. And he was, incredible prophecy. all he was doing was writing down, this is what they're yeah, going yeah. to do. Right. This is what they're going to do. And I, I, keep, I think of this all of the time, and after this is accomplished and the brave new world begins, it's going to reset itself. It yeah. has truth. We have no truth. Truth yeah. will restore itself. God help us, because there's, there's, there's got to be, this is like, to me, it's the etching in the stone. I mean, this is uh, because otherwise we have nothing. Um, but here's the, here's, the, here's the thing that makes me really sad about this, knowing this piece of work. And knowing that Rudyard Kipling has been utterly excised from all reading lists in every every place on earth and for one thing, yeah, for the comment about for the writing about the white man's burden, yeah. he's a, his, he is a goner. And yet George Bernard Shaw is held as a genius, right? The guy who came up with. There's got to be a way to just put them in some sort of a Eugenics, gas chamber. Uh, yeah. a, I mean, it's a, I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> oh, pe- people that were monsters have been sanctified, and yep. then this guy, who's yep. who's brilliant and obviously soul filled, yes, just completely erased. May you never be erased. Thanks so much. <laughs> I hope that doesn't happen. God bless.